This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Homestead Journey Podcast. This is episode number 142, and my name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Now, folks, I wanted to start out this episode by apologizing that there was no episode last week. My plan, as I had mentioned uh, two episodes ago, was to record my talk at the fair and then edit that on Monday and release the episode late. Unfortunately, the talk at the fair did not go off as planned. They needed to use the area where I normally give the talk for another event. And so they relocated me to an area where there was no foot traffic. And they also left the advertisement about my talk out of two of the three uh, publications that detail the events for the day. So it was really just uh, a bad, a bad situation. And I had nobody show up to hear me speak. And there was no way for people to randomly stumble across me because I was really in an out of the way place. And so I just opted not to go through with it because it would have been me really talking to Bonnie. And also I would have been competing with a musical act basically next door. My backup plan was to come home and to record the episode Monday evening, but I honestly was just absolutely beat. The fair, while I enjoy it, it takes a lot out of me. It just meant that by Monday evening, the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. (laughs) And so I just opted to take a week off and I appreciate your patience with me. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when I skipped an episode, something that I hadn't done since the beginning of this podcast. But when I came back for season three, part of my promise to myself was that I was going to give myself grace. And so I exercised that once again, and I appreciate you doing the same for me, but certainly apologies that I was not able to produce an episode last week. Now, I had contemplating using the fair notes for an episode for this week, but to be frank, most of what I was going to say at the fair is stuff that you've already heard me say. I was going to start by talking a little bit about what homesteading is, at least from my perspective, my definitions of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And then I was going to talk about some reasons why people get into homesteading that really, in my opinion, aren't good reasons. And then I was going to talk about some reasons why people might want to consider getting into homesteading. But really, all of that is ground that I've already broken and covered here on the on the podcast. And so today, we're going to go in a little bit of a different direction and talk about how I am taking steps right now to plan next year's garden. And I'm going to talk through some of the changes that I'm going to be making, not so that you can make the same changes because your situation is probably much different than mine, but just to give you some ideas of things that you might want to be thinking about as you think about garden 2023 and ways that you can already start setting yourself up for success for next year. But before we get into all of that, let's jump on over to this week's Homestead Happenings, and I'll bring you up to speed with what we've been doing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. So during fair week, not a lot took place here on the Homestead other than us making sure that the animals were fed and watered. But there really weren't as many animals to worry about here on the homestead because we took almost 60 chickens over to the fair. We took all of our geese. Now, our pigs didn't go, and I had shared with you how I kind of messed that up several weeks ago, so we're not going to 
get into all of that. But while that was a bit disappointing, I will also tell you that it really was a blessing in disguise because it really freed us up to be able to really be hugely involved in the poultry barn this year. Was that hugely involved? I don't know if that even makes sense, but more involved in the poultry barn this year than we have been in the last three or four years. And so that was that was a lot of fun, really being able to dive in and help out there and and make connections with the people that run the barn in a way that we haven't really been able to for the last several years. It really was a joy to be able to do that. It also meant that we didn't have to be at the fair from the moment the fair opened till the moment the fair closed, although many days I was. There were several days when I arrived at the fair at about six o'clock to help clean up the poultry barn. And I didn't leave the fairgrounds until 10 o'clock at night. I was there all day long and I enjoyed every minute of it. But as I said, it does take a lot out of you. It is very, very tiring. And so as usual, by the time the fair came to an end, I was very glad (laughs) to see that it had come to an end. But because of the fact that we didn't have pigs there, We were able to leave early on Saturday. We were able to get there a little later on Sunday. And Saturday, in fact, a friend of mine who I had gifted some of our bacon and some cowboy candy to, he and his girlfriend had a deli not too far away. And they're in the process of transitioning that to somebody else who's going to run it. And so their last weekend of operating it was the last weekend of the fair. And because I had gifted him that cowboy candy and the bacon, he decided to do a burger special that last weekend. And he named it after us. He named it the 3B Burger. And so Bonnie and I and Brian J, we all made the sojourn down there. It's about 25 minutes, half hour away. We went down there, enjoyed a burger. And again, that's something that we would not have been able to do if we had the pigs there at the fair. Let me tell you something, folks, that burger was by far and away the best burger I've ever had in my life. It was very juicy. The cowboy candy, the bacon and the cheese on it was just phenomenal. And it was worthy of the name 3B, (laughs) but it really, really was good. So if you're somebody who's wondering, what can you do with cowboy candy? There's just another thing you can do. Grill up some burgers put some cowboy candy on it, some bacon, some cheese. And let me tell you something, folks. Mm, It is delicious. Anyhow, back to the fair. We did very, very well in exhibiting this year. Our poultry exhibits did very well. Bonnie's Birds actually got a lot of Reserve Best in Show awards. Brian J's Geese got Best in Show and Reserve Best in Show. Of course, the fact is we were the only ones that had geese there. His trio of Speckled Sussex did very well. One of the other things that was very nice, we had let them know that this is probably Brian J's last year exhibiting poultry, at least at the youth level, because there's a good chance that he will be at freshman orientation next year when the fair rolls around. And so because he's exhibited there so long during the award ceremony that they have for the youth, they did have a special presentation for him. And that was very, very special, very, very nice. And it was greatly appreciated. I do put a lot of entries in the canning category. I did get best in show for green and yellow beans for my pepper relish and all of my other entries did very well. Now in the vegetable area, I I did okay. I had to scratch a lot as did many people. In fact, I was told that the number of entries in the vegetable barn were up this year, but the number of vegetables that actually got brought was down. And that's just because it really was a difficult year to garden. In fact, so many people that I've talked to when they say, how, you know, I say, how was your garden this year? Worst garden ever. My great uncle, Nat, who I was talking to a couple of weeks ago, said it's the worst garden he's ever had. And he's been doing this for... 60, 70 years. I don't even know. Um, So very, very frustrating. Nice to know that I'm not the only one that was scuffling. (laughs) But overall, my vegetables did, uh, did okay. I'm always very happy when I get first. And I've actually gotten first for the last several years in the cherry tomato division. That's a, that's a tough one to 
to get a ribbon in simply because so many people grow cherry tomatoes and submit them. But those chocolate cherry tomatoes have come through for me over and over and over again. And uh, they did so this year. So I was, I was proud of that. I'm also very proud of the fact that I was the only person to submit turnips this year and once again came in second place. <laughs> that takes a lot of skill. There were also only two of us that submitted green peppers this year and I came in third place. So it takes a lot of skill to do that. I'm very, very proud. So folks, uh, to be honest with you, probably they were very generous with me with regards to the second place with the turnips and the third place with the uh, green peppers. They certainly were not what I would have wanted to take, but it's what I had. And so I took what I had just so that I would not scratch. The other thing that I put in this year was an educational display that I had entitled from the garden to the pantry. And I really detailed in that from the moment you get seed catalogs in the mail to ordering the seeds, to planting the seeds and processing them via canning. And then I also included in the display, a pressure canner, a canning book, rings, lids, just things that I thought that maybe people had never seen before. And that really was very well received. And so I was very, very happy with that. Certainly the fair this year was bittersweet because as I mentioned earlier, there's a very good chance this is going to be the last year that Brian exhibits at the youth level. This is something that he's done now for I think 11 or 12 fairs. And it's really been a great, great opportunity for him. It's been a great learning experience for him. He's been able to exhibit and be involved in a lot of different areas. And I'm so thankful for that. It really has been something that has been an avenue through which we as a family have made a lot of great memories. And it's something that I would really encourage you. If you're somebody who is homesteading and you have a halfway decent county fair, get involved in it. If you can, get your kids involved in 4-H and get them involved in showing animals or crafts. There, there's so many different ways that they can be involved in the fair. And I think it's just such a great opportunity for them to grow as individuals. It certainly has been something that we have really greatly enjoyed. And it's something that I am going to miss um, moving forward. But as they say, we're on to a new chapter in life. And who knows, maybe as an adult, he'll come back and he will exhibit as I have. And maybe not. Who knows? But we certainly have made a lot of great memories through the years. And for that, I am very thankful. So that's a lot about the fair. Let me just tell you what we've actually been doing here on the homestead since. <laughs> um, a lot of it's just been playing catch up. When the fair is on, I don't pay attention to much that's going on here on the homestead other than to make sure my animals are fed, watered, and cared for. And so I have been spending some time catching up in the garden, picking tomatoes, putting them in the freezer. Yesterday, I picked all of my hot peppers and did up a batch of cowboy candy. And certainly, we'll be playing catch up in the garden for, for quite some time. This week, I was also able to get our pullets outside on grass for the first time. This is the longest I've ever kept them penned up. I'm a little embarrassed to say that, but there were a lot of reasons why that took place. And so this week, we were finally able to let them outdoors. And then that means every evening, we're having to go find chickens that are roosting in trees because they haven't figured out quite yet how to get back into the mobile coop. Some of that is because I don't have a ramp right now up to the pop door and it's a little high for some of them to be able to fly up into. So I do have to make a little bit of an adjustment there. And so until I get that done, we will be trying to chase chickens around to get them into the coop at night. Speaking of the pullets, today we actually got our first pullet egg. So that's always something very, very exciting. Now, they may have laid some at the fair. I don't know. Because at the fair, we just collect the eggs and they get given away to people. Each individual exhibitor doesn't maintain their eggs. So I don't know whether or not the pullets started actually laying at the fair or not. But the first ones that we have found on the homestead we found today, and that's always something very, very exciting to see. The last thing I wanted to share with you is I've been doing quite a bit of work on the farm truck. 
So this week I did plugs and I was very, very methodical in doing that. I would swap out a plug. I would put the plug wire back on. I would start the truck up just to make sure everything was good. Then I replaced the distributor cap and the rotor. I put new plug wires on it. And somehow in the midst of all of that, I found that there's a there's two check engine lights on this truck. There's a yellow warning check engine light, which has more to do with the emission system. And then there's a red engine light that can come on. And that is one that you have to pay attention to. The yellow one, you can put tape over, forget about it. But the red one, you got to pay attention to it. And so all of a sudden that engine, that red engine light came on and was staying on. And I really wasn't quite sure what had happened. I figured probably I had bumped something when I was changing plugs, wires, distributor, et cetera, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. And so I did some research and found that it probably was the oil sending unit wire had maybe come a little uh, disconnected. And so I popped that off. I popped it back on and boom, red engine light is gone. And then this afternoon, I swapped out the fuel filter. And folks, that thing is now humming just very, very beautifully. It idles so much better. So we'll see whether or not all of that did anything to the gas mileage. Because right now, I am getting about eight miles to the gallon on that thing. Now, thankfully, I don't have that far of a commute. And I expected not to have great gas mileage with that truck but I certainly had hoped it would be a little bit better than eight miles to the gallon. So we'll see whether or not the plugs and wires, new distributor cap, rotor, and the new fuel filter made any change. I also ran some seafoam through it, and we will see whether or not that makes any difference to the gas mileage. I will certainly keep you posted. Before we head on over to this episode's Charting the Course, I did want to remind those of you in the Northeast that next weekend, it's hard to believe, folks, but next weekend, the 10th and 11th of September, we are going to be holding the first annual fall gathering of the Homesteaders of New England. This is going to be taking place in Greenfield, New Hampshire. Tickets are only $25 for the entire weekend. We have some great speakers lined up. We've got some demonstrations lined up. We've got some great vendors that are going to be there. And all of that is really secondary to the fact that you're going to have the opportunity to be able to make connections with like-minded individuals from this area. People that understand the struggles that we face here in New England. Now, I'm technically not New England, but I'm an adopted New Englander, shall we say. <laughs> right across the border from Vermont. And there are certainly challenges that we have in New England that are different than the challenges from the mid-Atlantic and down to the southern part of the United States. And so we're going to be talking about some of that. The people that are talking are people from New England or formerly from New England in the case of Austin K from Homesteady, but we're going to let them back in, you know, just because we're nice like that. Uh, but it's going to be a great weekend. And so if you don't have your tickets yet, if you've been on the fence about it, join us in Greenfield, New Hampshire next weekend. It's going to be awesome. Now you can get your tickets and you can see all of the details about it by visiting mindfulhomestead.com slash hone 2022. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. So on today's episode, I want to talk about next year's garden and how you really should be planning next year's garden, or you, you should at least be starting to think about next year's garden right now. And I've talked to you about how it's important to kind of keep notes. I use Google Keep Notes to keep track of things I want to remember uh, throughout the season, maybe varieties that are doing well, varieties that didn't do so well spacing that I want to change, all of those kinds of things I keep track of in Google Keep Notes. And all of that is great. All of that's important. And you should continue that on throughout your gardening season. But as your garden starts to wind down, at least for many of us, unless you're somebody who pushes things on through four seasons, and for you, 
kudos, keep going. But I think even some of this still applies to you. There are things that you can be doing right now that are going to help set you up for success in 2023. And so today I'm going to share with you some of the changes that I'm going to be making, some of the things that I'm documenting right now to help me with next year's garden. The first thing I'm going to talk about are some infrastructure changes. And that's something that you might want to consider as well. Whether or not you action that now or you wait until the spring is up to you. And each situation is certainly going to be different. But you may want to think about putting in drip irrigation. You may want to think about maybe moving some garden beds around. You may be thinking about adding additional garden beds. And all of those things are things that you can do or can think about doing right now in the fall. In my instance, one of the things that I plan on doing this fall is narrowing my raised bed. So currently my raised beds are four feet wide by mainly eight feet long. I have a couple of, I think, 12 foot beds. What I want to do is narrow those down to about three feet wide. And the reason why is really twofold. First of all, My garden beds run pretty much east-west, and on the northern side of my garden beds, I have, we'll call them semi-permanent trellises. I have set up cattle panels on T-posts, and I use those for runner beans, I use those for pole beans, I use those for tomatoes, I use those for peas. Anything that likes to climb or needs to be trellised, I have found that those cattle panels work really, really well for. However, what that means is that that pretty much creates a wall and trying to harvest anything that's in that second row, that row behind there is difficult to do from the Northern side of my bed. But what I found is if I go from the Southern side of the bed and I try to reach in to harvest anything that's from, from that side, now it would be the third row in it's too far for me to reach without having to step on into my bed. The second reason, though, why I want to narrow my beds and make them three feet wide instead of four feet wide is because I place them too close together. I have about 18 inches, I believe, maybe 24 inches between my raised beds. In the spring, when I'm planting everything, it doesn't really bother me too much. But as things start coming in and start bushing out, Now, all of a sudden, if I'm not careful, I'm knocking fruit off. I'm knocking plants over. I'm having a hard time walking down the aisles. And so by narrowing my beds to three feet in width, it's going to give me another foot of space between the beds. Now, that does mean that I am going to be giving up, depending on the bed, eight to 12 square feet of growing space. And I certainly don't like that. That's going to impact some of the other decisions that I'm going to make as well that we'll talk about here in a minute. But if I find that that's too problematic, then what I'll do is just add a few more garden beds. I think I said there were two reasons why I'm narrowing the beds. There is a third reason why I'm narrowing the beds. And that is because this was untreated wood that I used and the ends are starting to rot off a bit. And so by me trimming those boards down, I should be able to trim out some of the rot and then get a couple more years out of these raised beds before I need to replace the wood. Some other infrastructure uh, changes that I'm going to make is I'm going to look for water timers and sprinklers on clearance this year because up at the Ruth Stout bed, I had a lot of problems this year because I didn't water it consistently. And part of the reason why I didn't water it consistently is because I don't have good infrastructure in place to be able to run hosing to that without having manual intervention. What I'm hoping to do is buy some additional timers and some Ys and some additional hoses so that I can hook everything up and leave it in place and then just let the timers work and water it and then turn it off And hopefully next year, I'll get a better harvest out of the Ruth Stout bed than I did this year. And the reason why I didn't get a great harvest from the Ruth Stout bed in part was because I didn't water it consistently. And so 
my plan next year is to add that in. Now, why am I not doing drip irrigation up there? The reason why is because my configuration in the Ruth Stout bed changes every year. And so I just am going to use the sprinklers for now until maybe I get a better feel for the rhythm of it. And then I may put drip irrigation up there. But for the time being, I think the sprinklers are going to be a better option for me. I'm also planning on taking down the fencing around the raised beds and clearing out the paths, adding more wood chips. This year, I just had a lot of weeds grow up around there. And part of that was because I couldn't get wood chips in there because I didn't have a method in which to haul them because I didn't have a truck. And part of it was because with that fencing being up, I couldn't get in there with a weed whacker to really knock it down. And so I do have a lot of weeds growing up in my paths that I really, really don't like. So I'm going to take down the fencing so I get into the paths a little bit better. That's also going to help me when I'm narrowing my raised beds. And then all of that hopefully will set me up for success for next year's garden up there. The last thing that I'm going to do, and I don't know if I would call this an infrastructure change, but it's certainly going to be a bit of a change in approach. And that is that I am actually going to start laying out my garden for next year, this fall in GrowVeg.com. That's the software that I use. In the past, what I've done is I've waited to the spring to kind of lay things out. And then what ends up happening is like everybody else, I've bought way too many seeds and I really don't know what to do with them. So by planting my garden now, when it comes time to order my seeds in the spring, I will know exactly what I need to order. And it will also help me know how much I need to start. Because in the past, I've just started whatever I could start. And then I end up with a lot of stuff that I don't need, that my dad doesn't need, and it ends up being a bit of a waste. And so if I can start other things that I might use in there, and in particular herbs is really where I'm going to try to focus next year. I'd hope to focus a little bit more on that this year. It just didn't work out quite as well as I had wanted to, but I will know exactly what I need. And that way I'll know what I need to get started. And I think that will be helpful. Not only am I going to tweak my infrastructure for next year, but I'm also going to, as I always do, tweak what I grow and how much I grow of certain things. One thing I'm going to change next year is I'm going to move all of my zucchini and summer squash out of my raised beds and move them up to the Ruth Stout bed. They just take over the raised beds too much. I always try to put them on the outsides but they still just take up far too much room. And so I'm going to definitely move all of that up to the Ruth Stout bed where I have more room for those kinds of things. I'm also done growing bush beans. I'm only going to grow pole beans moving forward. Pole beans just seem to yield a lot better for me and they just seem to do a lot better in the raised beds and even in the Ruth Stout beds than the bush beans do. And so bush beans are out and pole beans are going to take their place. Another thing that I'm going to be going back to is only growing Amish paste tomatoes for paste tomatoes. This year I did 12 Amish paste tomatoes and I did 12 San Marzanos. And the San Marzanos, and I know a lot of people love them, but they just simply did not produce like the Amish paste do. Now, it could have been the year. I don't know. But the Amish paste tomatoes are so much bigger. They're so prolific. And I just really, really like them better. And so I am going back to only growing Amish paste tomatoes for my paste tomatoes. One other thing that I'm going to be changing next year is to experiment a little bit less. And when I do experiment, experiment with smaller amounts. So this year, I should not have grown a dozen San Marzanos. I should have grown two or three San Marzanos in place of some Amish paste tomatoes, but still continue to grow a lot of Amish paste tomatoes. I have a tendency to do that. When I experiment with something, I go big or go home. And then I find out, oh, I've got a lot of stuff here that I really don't like, that it didn't work out well for me. And it's a waste of space in my garden, et cetera. And so I am going to, and I don't know that this is a good talk for me right now, whether or not I follow through on it, we will see. 
But my plan next year is to dial back on the experimentation, not to say that I'm not going to experiment with things, but just that I'm going to do it in smaller chunks, if that makes any sense. I also plan on growing a lot more beets next year than I grew this year. Uh, and I'm going to be growing less greens. I, I grew way too many kale, even more collards than I needed. In fact, I probably am not going to grow collards at all. I don't think we've eaten collards at all. And part of that is just because it's not really a thing up here in the North, but I really wanted to try them and then I grow them and then we don't eat them and it's just a waste of space. And so collards are probably out. We haven't eaten much Swiss chard this year. We didn't eat any spinach whatsoever, I don't think, before it bolted. And so I'm probably going to dial back on the spinach as well and just really focus more on things that we eat and things that we can preserve. Because one of the things right now that's very, very frustrating, and especially in light of all that's taking place with food prices, is that the amount of food that I have preserved and canned up and in the basement, in the larder, so to speak, is nowhere near what I would like. And part of that is because it was a bad year. Yes, part of that, though, was bad planning on my part. And I grew stuff, which is not easy to preserve, or at least to preserve in a way that we would use it, or it's stuff that we just don't eat that much of. And I grew too much of it once again. The final thing that I am going to try to do next year, and this will go into my garden plan, and that is to really think more about how I'm going to use the stuff that I'm planning in order to maximize production. This year, I didn't do a great job of that. And you couple that with a tough year. And again, that's led to us not having as much food in the pantry as we normally would have. And that upsets me quite a bit. And so I'm going to really try to think that through, take my own advice, <laughs> uh, and and to really think through how I plan on using the stuff that I grow, and then I can grow more of what we're going to use, more of what we're going to preserve, more of what we like to eat, and less about the stuff that I just want to play around with and experiment with. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Those are some of the changes that I am planning on making this fall, or at least thinking about already for next year to hopefully set myself up for a better gardening season than I had this year. This year for us here in the Northeast was challenging just because it was so wet in the spring and then so dry during the summer. And now we're getting a lot of rain. It's just been a really, really odd year. But some of that was also my doing by not compensating for that with better watering, more consistent watering, and also just me not planning the right things and maybe or maybe planning the right things at the wrong time. I, I don't know, just a lot of things like that. And so those are some of the changes that I plan on making for next year to hopefully help us achieve a better harvest here on 3B Farm and Homestead. If you have any questions or comments, you can always reach out to me. Brian at the homesteadjourney.net is my email address. I do hope to see some of you next weekend in Greenfield, New Hampshire. If you come by, definitely look me up and say hello. I would love to shake your hand and to put a, a face and a name together. I'm so looking forward to this event. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a great time. I'm actually going to get to meet Mr. Don Bradner in real life for the first time. So I'm super stoked about that. And it's going to be like the three amigos together, me, Jack, and Don going to be awesome. I'm also looking forward to meeting so many of the others that are going to be speaking. Austin K, uh, Morgan from Goldshaw Farm, just so many great speakers are going to be there. You're not going to want to miss out on it. And there's just going to be so many awesome people for you to connect with and interact with. Bonnie's putting together some programming for kids. So if you have kids and you are a little worried about that, we're going to have a kid corral and some kid activities things to keep them occupied. And so definitely, if you at all can make it, don't miss it. Hone 2022 in Greenfield, New Hampshire, going to be awesome. One last thing before I sign off, 
That is that next week's episode is going to be delayed a day. And that's because I'm going to be at home 2022 for the weekend. And so my plan is when I get back on Monday, I'm going to do an episode all about the gathering. Just give you the 411. It's going to be great. So you're not going to want to miss next week's episode. It's just going to be delayed by a day. All right, folks. Until next time, keep up the good work.